Sir, ma'am, thanks for joining us today on Leadership Log, which is a podcast for the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center community on topics of interest to our audience. And today, the topic of interest is learning a little bit, kind of the behind the scenes look at how to run a base, uh, especially during uh, during the events that we've got going on right now. So we're here with uh, with the two installation commanders that fall under the uh, Lifecycle Management Center. Um, so, sir, if you could uh, introduce yourself a little bit and give us a little of your career highlights to the audience. Absolutely. Uh, first, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us on this forum. I've watched a few of them now. Uh, love what I'm listening to and I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Uh, I'm Colonel Pat Miller. I'm the installation commander for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, born and raised in kind of West Central Pennsylvania, middle of nowhere, coal mining and farming. I went to Penn State uh, for ROTC, uh, where I got a civil engineer degree. It is interesting being the installation commander at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and being a Penn State grad. Uh, you know, this coming weekend uh, is going to be the Penn State Ohio State game. And so uh, I am friends with everybody until those couple hours, uh, and then we'll be friends again. Uh, but it's great to be back in Big Ten country. Uh, been in the Air Force a little over 23 years now, uh, 13 different assignments across those 23 years. I did my uh, Civil Engineer Squadron Command at Joint Base Charleston, was a Mission Support Group Commander at McDill uh, down in Tampa, Florida, spent some time at the Air Staff, uh, been at the at MAGCOM level at Air Mobility Command, uh, handful of deployments, Afghanistan twice, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, Cuba, got to spend some time on Joint Task Force Guantanamo for a few months leading an expeditionary civil engineer squadron. Uh, and before here, I was the vice commander for Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center. Uh, so I got to see the center level of AFMC in operation. Uh, the Air Force has probably overeducated me because I've got a chance to go to some great PME programs uh, and got a technical master's degree in civil engineering, uh, which brought me for my first time to Wright Patterson, where I taught at AFIT uh, for a few years as a young captain. Uh, so uh, love this base, love this area, love this community, and uh, look forward to serving each and every day. And so with that, I will throw it over to Kat uh, to do an introduction. Oh, thanks, Pat. I appreciate that. So Colonel Kat Stevens, Installation Commander here at Hanscom Air Force Base. Uh, I want to echo the sentiment. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity uh, to highlight what the installations bring to the fight for, for LCMC. So 25 years uh, in the Air Force. It's been a great ride. Uh, I'm a repeat offender here at Hanscom Air Force Base, so I was here 20 years ago. Uh, I left as the Air Base Wing Executive Officer, so no stranger to Hanscom Air Force Base. A uh, little fun, fun fact, I actually met and married my husband here, and well, we're still together, so something's working. Uh, so about 12 to 13 assignments uh, across the entire AOR. I've been, you know, overseas. Uh, I have a degree in community health, ironically, which has actually served me quite well in the last 18 months. I don't necessarily say that to too many people, uh, but uh, a plethora of opportunity to use those skills that uh, haven't necessarily used in, well, 25 years. Uh, but uh, very, very fortunate to be here in, in the great state of Massachusetts, uh, born and raised in Kentucky. Uh, no stranger to AFMC. This is my fourth assignment in AFMC. I, I have, well, before this, I was actually the vice wing commander at Robbins Air Force Base. So a great opportunity to, to stay in the AFMC family and, and being uh, coming back to Hanscom Air Force Base has been, honestly, it's been a dream come true. And I would argue that there is no better job uh, in the entire United States Air Force than, than leading, leading our CEOs and being an installation commander. All right, well, thanks very much. So uh, you're both at different installations. If you could um, tell us what makes your installation unique. And, uh, and, and I would venture to say you probably think it's the best installation, but, uh, but we won't get into too much of that. Uh, but tell us what, what makes it unique. Uh, sir, we'll start with you. All right, I, I appreciate it. I know there's a large swath of folks that are here at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Um, you know, as, as, as I look across it, I, I think one thing is the uh, diverse mission sets here. Uh, whenever you look at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, uh, it, it's the largest single site employer for the state of Ohio. Uh, and that's a neat moniker to have. But what I tell the community is um, we're here for the defense of our nation and we're extraordinary because of the surrounding community. 
Uh, and as you look at what we do for the defense of our nation, you have the acquisition side through Air Force Lifecycle Management Center. You have the research and development side through Air Force Research Lab. You have the education side through Air Force Institute of Technology, as well as what our 88th Medical Group does to produce uh, residents and medical professions as uh, one of the largest uh, graduate medical education programs here uh, across the, the DOD. Uh, you've got uh, the intelligence community with the National Air and Space Intelligence Center and then soon to be the National Space Intelligence Center uh, that's going to be co-located and partnered with NASIC. Uh, so there's so many neat things uh, that go on across this installation uh, and then add on top of it uh, Air Force Material Command. And so the, the jab I will throw at Cat uh, is that, uh, you know, General Bunch, we hear him often say Air Force Material Command is the most important MAGCOM in the United States Air Force. Uh, and we just happen to host Air Force Material Command. And so I won't tell you where our base sits uh, in the queue of most important bases across our, our Air Force. Uh, so <laughs> Kat, Kat, what, what, what's special up there at Hanscom? What do you have? Oh, only the fact that we're located in the hollowed grounds of the birthplace of America. I mean, that's, that's not insignificant. Uh, it's the only remaining active duty installation uh, in the New England region uh, to include upstate New York. So our AOR is very vast. You, you obviously there at Wright-Patterson, you have a lot of folks that are inside your fences. We actually, our servicing AOR is, is incredibly large and we service about 300 GSUs. So although our footprint is relatively small here, uh, our, our overreach or outreach is very, very significant. Uh, so today, we have multiple elements of the, the life cycle management center here, not to obviously notwithstanding the 66 air base group, but we also have three program executive offices uh, that, it, that are supporting AFMC and, and ultimately LCMC. That's digital, uh, command control communications intelligence networks, uh, better known as C3INN. And, and we also have a, a contingent of the presidential and executive airlift PEO here. So again, there's a lot of a lot of technological advances and a lot of opportunities here. Uh, notwithstanding, we actually have a part of the the nuclear weapons center here, and that's our NC3 program executive office. So uh, our footprint may be small, but our overreach and outreach is pretty significant. Uh, we do host the the MIT Lincoln Labs facility here. We have MITRE on the facility. We have uh, we we don't have an active flight line like our like our counterparts up there at Wright Ryder Patterson, but we do have an incredible relationship with Massport and the fact that we still generate lots of airlift and aircraft out of Hanscom Air Force Base uh, in support of various uh, missions that are returning from overseas or just transitioning from here to overseas. So again. Only that we just happen to be in the most hallowed part of the entire America, which, you know, it all started here. Uh, that's, I'll leave you with that. Yeah, all right. Uh, so as evidenced by the fact that, uh, uh, Colonel Stevens, you're, you're wearing your mask, um, COVID-19 has been kind of the, the elephant in the room pretty much from the day you both took, uh, took command of the organization. So uh, if you could, Talk to us a little bit about, um, uh, I know you've both been very proactive and especially trying to reach out and keep the community informed to keep the, your, your, um, your, your workforce informed. Um, so what are, the, what are some of the things that have went well for you um, going through COVID right now? Um, Colonel Miller, we'll start with you. Yeah, you know, like you said, the, this has kind of dominated the command. Um, both Colonel Stevens and I uh, took the flag uh, with COVID kicked off, right? And so uh, summer of uh, uh, 20, we, we both took the flag and we came in and, and I'm sure Kat had very similar concerns that I, I had. How do you establish trust and build relationships in an environment where at the time everybody was gone, right? Um, but then as installation commanders, we still have a mission set that drives people to the installation. Uh, you can't defend the installation with a defender from home. Uh, you can't maintain medical services with a medic from home. Uh, and so there are things that we need to do to bring in our team, as well as support those uh, that we're encouraging not to come to the installation during the COVID environment. Uh, and so it made it challenging to even try and do immersions. Uh, you think of a typical immersion for a new leader coming into an organization, and it's all about getting around, getting mission briefs, seeing people, uh, and really, um, you know, meeting those folks that are the strength behind every mission set that we have. 
uh, and not being able to do that um, drove me to uh, get comfortable being uncomfortable uh, and work on perhaps the hardest thing that anybody can work on, which is communication. Um, communication is hard, uh, hands down. Uh, it is hard when you're face to face. It's hard when you're in a meeting room. Uh, it gets harder in a virtual environment uh, where folks uh, get comfortable with a camera off, uh, multitasking goes up. Uh, you ask a question and somebody's probably three screens into something else uh, before they get the camera back on and, and, and realize that you're talking to them. And so it's trying to figure out how do you um, be transparent? How do you uh, communicate what's going on? Uh, how do you do that across multiple audiences? Because it's easy to send uh, an installation-wide email uh, and inform the folks that have access to the AFNET, um, but it's different to try and communicate with the retirees that use your installation because they're not on that email distribution list. Uh, and so you have to figure out how to navigate uh, the various medium uh, mediums that are out there. I mean, we're using Zoom for this. Uh, we were on CBR teams, now we're on Chess teams. Uh, everybody was picking a platform. Uh, and it was nice to see the Air Force uh, and DOD kind of zoom, zoom in, if you will, uh, to <laughs> identify a platform of choice to, dr to draw out that standardization. Um, but initially, it was kind of that wild, wild west. Uh, and everybody was trying to figure out how to get things done. How do you provide a safe, healthy environment where folks can execute the mission um, but still maintain a fabric of social connection uh, so that you could work on acculturation and, and, and uh, establish the right climate for the organization, um, have folks connected to both myth and mission and each other. Uh, and the further we went into COVID, the harder it was um, because people got into a groove of a comfort level of where they're at and what they're doing. Um, and, and so it, it's fighting tooth and nail uh, to, to work hard on that culture piece. Uh, to keep people tied to that mission. And, and uh, Kat, I don't know about you, but man, it, it's been a slog the whole way, right? But it's it forced us to get uncomfortable. Yeah, the struggle's been real. That is absolutely for sure. And I, I will tell you, uh, uh, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned during this COVID thing is that not everybody listens and hears the same thing. Uh, and not everybody uses the same medium or mode to get their information. So it was really incumbent upon on myself and my team because I'm I am I am merely the vessel. I am surrounded by a group of professionals that that are were seeking out those innovative ways to to connect to people, to people so people felt like they had value, purpose, and meaning. Uh, because psychologically, this has been a this has been a challenge. And, and and when you say that the struggle is real, it's those are true statements. So, you know, your points were absolutely all, all valid. And, and when taking the flag, it was, it was uncertainty. It was complete uncertainty because the way that it had been done for at least my 25 years was not the way that it was going to be done now. So it was, it was learning, learning different things at different times and being okay with that, uh, being vulnerable uh, and, and really taking a step back and listening to what the people needed and how the people learned, how the people listened, uh, and really delving into that. So uh, kind of all over the map there, but the, the reality is, is that this has taught us to appreciate connectivity even more. It, it's taught us that sometimes you just need to listen to learn uh, and that's that's what I've learned sitting where I sit uh, and and really empower people in your organizations across the, the portfolio and the spectrum, uh, empower the people to come up with with viable solutions. Uh, one thing I failed to mention is that uh, I, we, there are 731 houses on this installation, only 40% of those are actually inhabited by Air Force personnel, so this is not a joint base. Uh, but it is a joint housing community. So learning again, different ways how those individuals and those people connect to one another and really tapping into those and creating networks and networks and networks so that we're sharing as much information as possible. Because the one thing that, that we all have in common is, is a need to know what's happening and what's going on. So that's, that's really been the biggest challenge sitting as the installation commander is, is really learning how people learn 
uh, and adapting so that we are communicating and being transparent to your point uh, as much as possible. So again, we continue to learn that lesson every single day. So, uh, you know, the Air Force does this thing uh, called where, uh, where airmen get information. It's like a survey they do every three or four years. And historically, the number one choice of everyone to get their information is directly from the commander. Okay. And, and so it might be a different, a number of different avenues. It could be a written message. It could be um, on a, on a commander's call or something, but they know that the commander's got the best information and I want to hear it directly from them. If I get it filtered through other sources that it has a tendency to get kind of misshapen, you know? And so uh, of course during COVID, there's so much information out around vaccines and how does it, how does the disease transmit and how do you you know pass it on and and so I think it's really important that the commanders engage and give you know trustworthy information to people so that they can make decisions you know going forward uh, and and you both have, have leaned forward on that in a number of ways including social media so I just wanted to see what are some ways that you've used social media to try and connect with your audience, you know, especially realizing that um, you can't just have a, a, an airman's call and have everybody come to the base theater and talk to the, the whole group, you know. So, uh, sir, we'll start with you and just what are some innovative outreach ways that you use to try and uh, talk with the with the with your audience? Yeah, I, I will tell you, I am not a social media giver. Right. It, it is not my thing, uh, not a space I'm comfortable in. Uh, we've got some smart folks that are. Uh, and so they will part and piece the, the messages out and, and get that information out. Uh, what, I, what I love about the opportunity that we have in, in the operating environment that we're in, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't use those terms lightly. This is our new operating environment, right? After 9-11, um, we had a different operating environment. The way we went to the airport changed after 9-11, and we're still doing that. Uh, the way we navigate things uh, through this COVID and post-COVID, it's a shift in our operating environment. We're going to change the way we do things. And there are some things that we're going to sustain. Uh, I've, I've been to a few commander's calls throughout my career, right? Um, never have I had so many people at a commander's call than I've had at a virtual commander's call uh, because I can reach more. Uh, whenever I took the flag on the 12th of June last year, uh, never would uh, as many family members be able to go to that change of command as we're able to participate in that change of command uh, last year. And so there's some things that we're going to sustain uh, as we uh, power through this operating environment uh, that provide better connectedness. Uh, and that's what we learned uh, by navigating these different social media platforms and sharing of information and trying to be very transparent. Um, and, and there is definitely a battle in the information space uh, whenever it comes to controversial topics. Uh, and it is our job as leaders to arm and equip the team uh, with the best information that we have available. And, and that's what we work hard to do is try and get that information out to as many places as possible. Um, but I would encourage you, don't, don't solely rely on me. Um, look for yourself because uh, a lot of these things are tough individual decisions that, you, that people are going to rumble with. Um, but we're going to work hard to be transparent. We're going to hit every media platform possible, uh, you know, still doing the print with the Skywriter and the base newspaper uh, for the folks that like to pick up that paper and feel that, uh, you know, uh, texture underneath their hands as they're reading uh, all the way to, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and, and, and pick a shot there. Uh, whatever your soup du jour is for uh, uh, social media platforms. Um, but we've learned a ton. You know, the, the very first town hall uh, that my predecessor did uh, was with a tablet in a conference room. And now we have a sign language interpreter and two cameras and a sound system and all kinds of stuff. And it's a professional media production uh, to do a town hall. Uh, and so it's been a pretty fascinating evolution uh, in communication uh, during, during this uh, past year. Yeah, I, yeah. The so the interesting, interesting choice of words, and I like that. The operational environment has absolutely changed. Uh, I will tell you that uh, our newspaper actually fell victim to COVID nineteen because the publisher uh, he literally had to uh, 
cut some resources that weren't weren't very lucrative. So we don't have that tactile, that that paper that we've had for for a number number of years. But we do have the AFMC Connect Connect app. We do utilize that platform very very readily, uh, where we we push out information as much as possible. I keep telling and joking with people uh, that you know we're making them Facebook famous because uh, much like you, Pat, I am not a social media person. I do not enjoy this whatsoever. I would so much rather sit down with an individual or a group of individuals, regardless of, of, of what they do or what they bring to the fight and just look them in the eye and have a conversation. Uh, but that's not, that's not where we are right now. I, I would say moving forward, we need to find that balance. Uh, much like you, when you when I took command on the 24th of June, uh, we reached thousands and thousands of people, which absolutely blew my mind. I'm like, how many people really, first of all, really cared that this was happening? But it was, it was, it was eye opening to me that to see that people are looking for opportunities to connect and understand what was going on, and understanding what the right and left parameters were uh, for the installation and what the expectations were. So. Some of the really valuable lessons that moving forward is that every media platform that we use is going to connect, and I, I said this earlier, I alluded to it earlier, it's going to connect a different group of individuals. So I would say moving forward, what we really need to focus on is that balance. Uh, we've worked really hard to incorporate uh, network capabilities in all of our meeting rooms so that we can do a hybrid mix of, of whatever it is. If it's a if it's a town hall meeting, if it's if it's a commander's call, if it's if it's an installation staff meeting, whatever that is, is recognizing that everyone is utilizing or working in the correct current operating environment, respecting that and creating them an opportunity to stay connected. Mm -hmm. So, sir, you you alluded earlier, um, obviously, with the mission groups that sets that you have some things have to be done in person okay so cops have to come to the gates they have to physically be there um, firemen have to be on the base uh, you have a lot of customer service organizations that not only have to to come on base to provide that service but they also have to engage directly with customers in order to do that and so the challenge there is how do you how do you keep those people safe for one um, so that the customers are safe when they come in, but also your workforce is safe as well, and that they feel confident that that leadership is doing everything they can to keep them safe. So, uh, it and and I'll and I'll I'll show I'll throw a little uh, bone towards you. Uh, recently, I had to get my ID card renewed, and I was a little worried about it, you know, because uh, you know you hear horror stories about the lines. I came in. Uh, they told me a time of the day to come back. I came back, I was seen within like five minutes. They also took care of my wife at the same exact time. I mean, it was so easy and painless um, uh, that it was, um, uh, you know, just kind of shocking to me. So, uh, so I, I, will I will give you that, uh, that kudo. If, if you could uh, go ahead and record that and put that out on our <laughs> Facebook site, I, I would really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, there, there are plenty of areas where uh, Colonel Stevens and I both get lots of feedback and recommendations on how to improve. Um, you know, so so I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, um, part of our job uh, as leaders is to provide a safe, secure environment for the team to execute the mission. Uh, and we need to invest in the team each and every day. Um, I constantly tell folks, uh, there's not a single person uh, in the 88th Air Base Wing that works for me. Uh, you know, I serve them each and every day. And so they're my responsibility. And I need to make sure that I'm setting the conditions for folks to succeed. Uh, and so there was lots of innovations as, as we worked through uh, the early stages of COVID. Uh, you saw those customer um, uh, separation, plexiglass separations at a lot of uh, customer service areas. Uh, that way you can maintain visual contact with folks, engage in a conversation, um, but still have some sort of barrier. Uh, but over the last year and a half, year plus, we've learned a lot about uh, the way this virus spreads. Uh, and uh, And that has helped. And so I think you know, sometimes folks get a force health protection measure, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, confused with a protective measure, right? That force health protection measure, that uh, FPCon uh, mm -hmm. or HPCon health protection condition, uh, that is tied to a threat level, right? You think about your FPCons, uh, you know, uh, an Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and we've been a 
Bravo, Epicon Bravo for a long time. That's just kind of a normal practice. And who knows if uh, we'll get back to an HBCon uh, alpha as a norm, or maybe Bravo settles out as a norm as we as we move on, just like an FBCon level did. Uh, but you can separate uh, protective measures from your health protection condition level, right? One is a threat, and the other is how you're combating that threat to create a safe environment. And as we've evolved and learned more about uh, uh, COVID, we've realized well there's some things that are that are proven measures. Uh, you know, in a high community risk area, we, we should be wearing masks. Uh, uh, we want to make sure that we're having that physical distancing. If I could get rid of anything from our lexicon from whenever COVID started, it would be social distancing, right? <laughs> uh, we want to maintain physical distancing. We need mm -hmm. to maintain social mm -hmm. connection, right? Uh, and so focusing on that physical distancing, uh, we now have a vaccine that has proven uh, to be effective uh, against the virus. And so as we do those things and we incorporate those things into day-to-day -day operations, um, we get more effective and we get more efficient. Uh, and we show the force that we can protect them uh, the way we incorporate those, those layers. But those protective measures adjust over time, even though an, even though an HPCon may stay consistent. Uh, and so it's building that confidence for the team that it's okay to come back to the work center if that's the right place you need to be uh, to execute your mission set. Ma'am, what has been the experience you found up there? So we were very fortunate here because we were able to leverage technology and Colonel Miller mentioned some very, very key things that that we also incorporated here, the, the plexiglass, the, the hand sanitation stations, the, the, the physical distancing, because to your point, and which is I think it's absolutely uh, imperative that we get away from social distancing, uh, physical distancing, we, we continue to do that. Uh, and as we continue to navigate through the, the Delta variant and then the various things that are that are coming down the pike, pike uh, what we try to reiterate it is, is it's a personal responsibility to make sure that that you are taking care of your space and ultimately that's going to affect the entire community. So I, I, I can't I can't stress enough how it's everyone's responsibility uh, to make sure that we are all safe, the collective we are safe. As we roll into the holidays, uh, the messaging is going to ramp up. I'm sure Pat and his team are going to be ramping up this, the messaging about, you know, making sure that that you're taking all the, the proactive measures uh, necessary to mitigate the transmission of, of or the spread of the, the variants that are coming up. But I will also say that we're also a product of our environments. You know, we in Massachusetts are, we have the luxury of, of the majority of the people here, 70 percent have been vaccinated. So again, it, it's about it's about the environmental factors. Uh, so we sit in a pretty good position. I will tell you that we were never going to negate or mitigate the importance of safety. Uh, and, and it's everyone's responsibility to ensure that we're doing what we need to do to make sure that we're keeping the installation safe, the family members safe, uh, and that permeates through everything that we do and all the actions that we take. So uh, I think part of this is going to really inform the operating environment moving forward. Uh, what we're going to maintain, what we're going to sustain, uh, and how we're going to best deal, uh, if you will, with what opportunities or challenges we are faced. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, uh, it highlighted that you both took uh, command while COVID was going on, you know, but being an installation commander is one of those kind of pinnacle jobs, right? It's one of those jobs that when you're a captain, you're coming along and you think, you know, one day when I'm the boss, okay, I'm going to do A, B, and C. And, and so I, I just wonder, did you have any of those things that you thought of through your career that you thought, you know, if I'm ever an installation commander, I'm going to, I'm going to try and do this, or I'm going to try and do the job this way. And, and did, did COVID allow for that to still happen? Or did it, did it maybe overwhelm some of those, some of those uh, objectives that you might've had? Uh, and, and sir, we'll start with you. Pat, I can't wait to hear what you're going to say about this one. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so this is interesting because uh, probably like Kat, I never in a million years thought I'd be in the position I'm in. Um, it, it, it's just one of those things that, uh, uh, you know, very few people get an opportunity to do. Um, and, and so uh, being selected to lead uh, and serve an installation and in the community is truly remarkable. 
Um, you know, one of the things uh, that I have on my desk, and it, it, it's sitting on my desk right in front of me, uh, it's a little, I guess, probably a, a four by three placard, uh, and it says, I am they, right? I am they. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's that reminder to me uh, that as I sit here making decisions or, uh, you know, whether I'm looking at uh, awards packages or uh, below the zone promotion packages or separation packages, debarment, um, policies as we navigate COVID, whatever it is, um, there's somebody out there on the other end of this thing uh, that's sitting there going, man, they don't get it. They don't understand uh, they don't uh, care about us. They don't this, they don't that. Uh, and I'm the they that they're talking about. Uh, and so I, I, you know, it, it, every step of the way uh, throughout my leadership journey, throughout this Air Force journey, uh, it's always kind of figuring out uh, when I'm in that they seat, um, what do I want folks say? Um, and, and being aware that there's somebody on the other end uh, that has a perception of this, right, wrong, or indifferent, they're going to have a perception. Uh, and so how do we uh, get to the best point for the good of the team uh, while taking care of, uh, you know, families uh, and, and service members uh, and, and the entire team, uniform, non-uniform, throughout this entire process? And so for me, it was always a, how do I set the right conditions for success? Uh, I'm a very big proponent of professional development. Uh, and so one of the things that I wanted to do was build an ecosystem around professional development uh, and uh, hitting it across the board, right? Hitting it with our uh, civilian teammates, hitting it with our enlisted and officer airmen, um, figuring out how do you integrate and create some uh, joint uh, development opportunities for the entire team to come together. And then where do you have your stovepipe uh, military civilian enlisted <laughs> officer uh, development? Uh, but, but have this ecosystem where you don't have the top four and the rising six and pick an organization competing in the same battle space, uh, make them complementary uh, and focus on that tiered development. I know the chief loves to mentor the airmen, um, but the chief needs to be mentoring the senior NCO who's mentoring the NCO who's mentoring the airmen. Uh, otherwise, how do you grow that NCO to become the senior NCO to become the chief? Uh, if we're not focusing on tiered development and allowing folks to do it. It's absolutely fun to mentor the airmen directly, um, but you got to grow leaders. Uh, and so that's one of the things for me that I wanted to focus on uh, is establishing that ecosystem for professional development where everybody has an opportunity to thrive. Um, but at the end of the day, the individual has to make the choice to say, hey, I want to take advantage of this program. I want to be part of this uh, and jump in. And so I was thrilled. Uh, we had our uh, unit effectiveness inspection in June, uh, and I was thrilled that we ended up scoring a highly effective in professional development. Uh, and so that told me it paid off uh, what we're trying to do uh, from a top four standpoint uh, in making sure that we're hitting professional development across the board. So that was the one thing for me that I wanted to make sure I was emphasizing is our people. Um, you know, we, we say we're a people driven mission focused team. Uh, and our people are decision makers. They don't hide behind uh, AFIs and, and regulations and processes and procedures. Uh, each one of our warfighters is a decision maker uh, and they're empowered to do so. And so how do we invest in our people uh, to arm them to do that? Yeah, that's great. And, and I'm glad that uh, COVID didn't, didn't thwart that effort to, uh, to get that done. So, uh, ma'am, what, what about you? Did you have something that you looked at? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I will tell you, and I mentioned earlier, you know, COVID with COVID has presented multiple opportunities. And I think, I think for you, Pat, getting after your, you know, developmental and, and really inspiring folks to, to really educate themselves is fantastic. Uh, I, I've, for 25 years, I mean, I've, I've been in the people business for 25 years. I mean, that's, that's what I've been in. Uh, and, and when I got here, it was never, it's never about the me, it's about the we. Uh, so I liked your statement that you, that you pointed out there, I actually wrote that down. So that that's good stuff. Uh, and, and I, and I've said from the beginning, you know, if you take care of the people, uh, the people will take care of the mission. Uh, I do consider, uh, the people our most valuable weapon system. Uh, I think we need to invest time and energy into them, uh, whatever they need. Some need the, the professional development. Some some need the the spiritual connectedness. Some need some need. I mean, everybody needs something different. It's just recognizing what that is, 
understanding too that you can't actually get after everything so you have to you have to inspire empower people to 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 take your your methods or, or your ideologies and really bring them to fruition so again it's about the relationships it's about the trust it's about making sure that everybody understands what the expectations is it's communication communication is hard you know we we too had our our unit and unit effective inspection and, and we did quite well in, in spite of uh, the current environment of the situation and one of the things that I was I was pretty proud of. Uh, yeah, obviously the developmental piece was great, but one of the things that they highlighted was our strategic messaging and then my thing is that we need to be ready every single day we don't need to wait for somebody to tell us that they're going to come inspect us and then you know, do all this cramming sessions to be ready. So we, we operationalized the, the major graded areas and incorporated that into our strategic plan and everything feeds off of that. So we are ready every single day to attack or accomplish whatever challenge or opportunity is presented to us. Everybody understands what those expectations are and everybody appreciates what everybody brings to the fight. Recognizing that, again, it is absolutely our people that drive success not only here at the 66, but in the Air Force and, and in the Space Force writ large. So I had a commander who once said um, that he would rather be the commander of a broom closet than the vice commander of the world. And, 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 and he wasn't trying to be offensive to vice commanders. He was just trying to say how great it is to be a commander. Um, so I, I wanted to just kind of here, what, what do you think is the best thing about being the installation commander in an organization? So, uh, sir, what do you think? Hey, so, so with all due respect, I'm going to punt this one to Kat first because she's lived oh. both worlds, right? She is. She started. She her last job. She was the vice wing commander uh, and uh, and and did that, right? And and man, I I was a vice commander for a center, uh, and and vice is hard business, right? Vice is hard business because you are responsible for nothing. Well, you're responsible for nothing, but in charge of everything. Uh, you know, the boss kind of hands you the stick and says, hey, go do this. And, and, yeah. and you're running the operations um, while the commander's out doing uh, the commander things. Uh, and so Kat, I'll, I'll let you take first crack at this because you lived the vice commander world at an installation level, and now you're living the commander world. So let me tell you something, you know, they say tongue in cheek that the curse of the vice, I'm going to tell you, the curse of the vice is a real thing. <laughs> uh, inevitably, anything that's going to go wrong on the installation happens when the principal or the installation commander is off station. Uh, I lived that dream, but it also created an opportunity for me to learn from an incredible leader uh, incredible leaders. I, I had two uh, wing commanders that I was, I had the dubious honor and privilege to be their vices, but uh, it gives you an opportunity to learn. And, and again, uh, I mentioned this earlier, you think differently. Uh, you, you start thinking more holistically, more strategically, if you will, less tactically. Uh, that was very, that was a hard transition for me. Uh, but so I had training wheels on for two wheels to, for two years. It was fantastic. Uh, it was a great opportunity to learn. Uh, but what makes being an installation commander uh, honestly awesome is the, the effect that you have, the effect and effect you have on the installation, on the community, on the people, how you can chart a course or the path to get the installation to the next level uh it's it's showing relevancy it's 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 being a teammate it's it's relationships it's a whole host i can give you all kinds of of adjectives and adverbs that that just makes it sound cool but uh i would tell you what for me uh it's an honor and a privilege it is a distinct honor and a privilege that's that I was given and afforded the opportunity uh, to do and to work with such incredible people uh, serving an incredible mission uh, and uh, not everybody gets this opportunity so i'm not taking a day for granted every day is an opportunity uh, to make a difference uh, in, in my life and, and everybody else's life so you know. That's a lot of words to say it's an awesome job. It's an awesome responsibility. Uh, I don't necessarily want to marginalize it because it's it's pretty, sometimes it's overwhelming. Let's be real, let's be truthful. Uh, this job is hard, uh, 
The people make it a little more palatable. Sometimes the people make it a little more challenging, but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. uh, being an installation commander, again, it, it's, it's, uh, it's phenomenal. It's rewarding, uh, it's challenging, uh, and it's something that I will definitely treasure for the for however many longer or however many years I have left wearing this this uniform. So, uh, Pat, interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, for, for me, it's a lot of the same lines. It, it, it's the relationships um, that make it special, uh, and it's the ability to impact lives um, uh, that you work hard for each and every day. And it's recognizing you have that awesome responsibility to uh, take care of the community, take care of um, you know, the installation itself, because you, you know, I tell folks as the 88th Air Base Wing Commander, uh, you know, I, and, and Kat kind of holds two titles as well, right? You hold this commander of your wing, right? Or in Kat's case, uh, uh, the Air Base Group. And so we, we are commanders in that capacity, and we're responsible for a subset of people uh, in that capacity. And then you have this title of installation commander. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, what you want to do as a commander of your organization and what you do want to do as a commander of the installation, sometimes they're, they're intention, uh, right? Because you know your team is running hard and they need to take a knee, uh, but your mission partners and the community need you there. Uh, and so it's this tough uh, tug and pull, uh, but man, to see uh, and live the highs and lows of your team uh, throughout that entire process, uh, to be able to uh, walk out in the community and have somebody walk up to you and say thanks uh, for what you're doing, or hey, I want to introduce you to my husband or wife or my kids, um, uh, reminds you that you're making a difference each and every day. And as Kat alluded to, in every, in every job that you're in, especially as a leader of an, uh, of an entity, whether it's a section, a flight, a directorate, or a commander of an installation, um, there are some hard days. Uh, there are some days you go home and, and, and you want everybody every day to go home and, and be like, man, that was an awesome day. We kicked butt today. We nailed these things. Um, but there are days you go home and you're like, wow, what just happened? <laughs> you know, that, that was a slobber knocker, man. I can't <laughs> believe what we just went through. Um, but then you think about the team. You think about why you serve. You think about the differences that you're making. You dust yourself off. You learn from the experience and you get back in the fight. Um, and, and it's recognizing uh, what you're fighting for, not what you're fighting against. Uh, each and every day you're fighting for the team. Um, uh, that's going to be maybe in the discipline world one day, in the recognition world another day. Um, but looking left and right, uh, seeing the teammates that you're in the grind with, uh, fighting for them each and every day and knowing that you're making a difference. Um, it, it's just the 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 amount of impact that you have as an installation commander goes beyond just your organization, um, you know, your wing or group that you're responsible for, um, but it impacts the retiree base, it impacts the contractor base, it impacts the surrounding community, right. and to be able to build those relationships uh, and have an impact across that entire swath is, is just an awesome, awesome responsibility. Uh, like, like Kat said, it's just one you don't hold lightly. Uh, and, and so you hold it near and dear, you, you uh, kind of uh, take it as yours. What I tell folks every single day is um, make it personal. Don't take things personally. Um, because in the seat we're in, uh, we get lots of feedback uh, and some of it's not too kind, right? Uh, but uh, you got to be open to all the feedback. You, you really do. Uh, and you have to dig through it and say, is that just a difference in perspective? And we're still getting after the mission and taking care of people and the team. Um, uh, or is that, is there a nugget there that I need to get after and we can get stronger? And so I take every last bit of feedback. Uh, I parse it out from that standpoint. If it's a difference in perspective in the way we deliver things. Okay. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm not taking it as a personal attack, um, exactly. but I yeah. will make it my personal mission to take care of this team and take care of this installation, take care of this community. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, I guess that's kind of the big thing for me is make it personal. Don't take things personally. That's yeah, really it, and if and if I may, and if I may, so, you know, when Pat and I took the the, the flag, we we came with an expiration date. Uh, so we know we have a set amount of time to to do what we think is right and and take the the installation and our respective installations in the direction in which we think they need to go. And, and part of that is making sure that the changes that we're making is sustainable. 
Because if we, if we don't sustain those changes when we leave, then I would argue that what we did was not really effective. Uh, that we, we need to make sure that we're not being so myopic because again, it's not about, it's not about me and it's not about, it's, it's not about us, it's about the collective we. And as, as you said, Pat, we are the they. So we want, we want to ensure that when we're assimilating all of this information and we're making whatever changes or course corrections that we feel needs to be made are, are sustainable, that they're not just going to end when we depart the pattern. So again, that's uh, uh, when you figure that into the decision making process, that's, that's, you just have to think much, much further than the end of your nose. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that pretty much brings us to the end of our time. Uh, but before we close, I just wanted to give you both the opportunity if there is anything I forgot to ask about or anything that you would like to interject. Um, and ma'am, we'll start with you. Uh, again, I appreciate this opportunity. This, is, this has been fantastic just to sit down and kind of highlight at least our philosophies, if you will, behind uh, being part of a great team. Uh, here at, at Hanscom, you know, our vision is, is pretty, it's pretty simple. We determined, deliberate, and decisive support that's indispensable uh, to our community and to our mission partners. And I think that really summarizes very adequately and apropos what we have just talked about, is that we are here to take care of people uh, and our partners and, and be transparent and, and communicate things as they come down the pike and understanding that every day is an opportunity to have an impact and influence uh, where we're heading next. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, man. And, sir? And, and I will echo Kat's thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to chat. Um, lots of great conversation today. So it's always uh, great to be in the battle with my buddy there, uh, Kat Stevens. Uh, she's doing an awesome job at Hanscom. And, and so it's been fun ride uh, for this first year and a half and, and uh, uh, hard to believe we're in the home stretch. Uh, and we'll swap out uh, next summer with some new amazing leaders uh, to lead our respective organizations. Uh, you know, she uh, kind of uh, uh, left with her vision for, for uh, the group there and in the, in the installation. Uh, what I love most, uh, you know, and every base, every organization has a mission vision, um, but I, I'll draw out our motto um, and that's strength through support. Um, as an air base wing, uh, that's exactly what we do. Um, sure, we're responsible for operating, uh, sustaining, protecting, and defending the installation. Um, but we provide strength through support to all of those mission partners across this installation so that they can execute their missions uh, to the community, uh, to our family members, uh, to that large retiree base and their families, to all of that extended family. Um, but we also in, uh, introspectively uh, or internally, we, we, we provide strength through support to each other in the 88th Air Base Wing as we're executing those missions. And so I love uh, the strength through support motto um, because it talks about what we do for our, our stakeholders, our customer base uh, throughout the installation community, as well as what we do for each other. And I think if we stick with those simple words, uh, you know, our organization, the LCMC family writ large, uh, will continue to do some amazing things. And so I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you today. All right. Well, thanks very much uh, to both of you for joining us today on Leadership Lab. We really appreciate your time and and look forward. Perhaps we can uh, do a another version here in uh, in the in the near future. So, anytime. All right. Sounds good to Thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you.